Okay, so this is the first part of structural violence. Um, we're going to cover social stratification. This one's a bit lengthy, so we may split it into two, but we'll see. The idea is we're going to define structural violence, look at the characteristics of social stratification, hierarchical structures such as class, ethnicity, and gender, patterns of wealth and income inequality, stratification and how that relates to life chances, and then inequality and violence. Uh, this is a quote by Robert Kennedy, um, as said by a congresswoman. There is another kind of violence in America, slower but just as deadly, destructive as the shot or bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference and inaction and slow decay. This is the violence that affects the poor, that poisons relations between men and women because their skin is different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. Uh, structural violence is defined as violence that occurs in the context of establishing, maintaining, extending, or reducing hierarchical relations between categories of people within a society. And violence can be an outcome of how we have organized the society in terms of life chances, or it can be an outcome of systems of stratification within a society. So what is social stratification? It's the ranking of people in a vertical arrangement that's top to bottom that differentiates them as either superior or inferior to each other. So if you've listened to any of my other um, lectures, this is the table that I'm talking about where you're either sitting at the head of the table or you're sitting somewhere along the, the line till you get to the end. Um, social stratification refers to structural inequality. Structured uh, is the presence of forces that create these patterns it's not a result of biology. Um, this is not a um, people are genetically inferior or anything like that. This is a social creation. And social patterning of stratification is found in the distribution of rewards, rules for behavior, and social expectations and perceptions. Patterned behavior is also achieved through the socialization process. So what are these characteristics of the systems? It, social stratification is a characteristic of society. It's, it has no relation to um, the individuals. It is universal and variable. It persists over generations. This is a long-term issue. It is supported by beliefs and ideologies. And people in a society may be conscious or unconscious of their position within those systems. If you remember in the previous section, we had talked about um, false consciousness um, where you believe you are part of a certain group and you indeed are not um, that is being unconscious of your position so hierarchical structures within societies um, Societies of the world today are organized in at least four fundamental 
hierarchical relations. And those are class, gender, ethnic or racial identity, and age. Violence is a means to maintain these structures, and the structures themselves have violent outcomes in how they relate to opportunities and life change chances. Where structural violence is intersected with interpersonal and institutional, we see violence to create, maintain, or change these structures. So these are the individuals and institutions who are attempting to change this hierarchy and that is an intersection where we generally see violence. Where structural violence is violence in and of itself, we see how position affects life changes or life chances, including life expectancy. So in which of these positions in any society are you going to find the highest rate of violence and the lowest life expectancy? Something we'll get to. Um, so social class, this is a category of people who have a common relationship to production. As in, this is related to your work, what you do. Um, class structure in a capitalist society, such as what we have, <clears throat> There it has the following class positions. They're the capitalists. These are the owners that control production. The working class, they don't own anything as far as business. They don't control production, but they sell their capacity to work. So these are the people that go in and say, okay, I might not own the factory, but I will sell you my labor for whatever your asking price is. Um, there's two other positions that are important but are not essential. These are the independent producers, self-employed people, and the managerial class. And the managerial class, they don't own anything, but they control the production for those who do. The, this is the early, or the most recent one I could find um, of distributions of wealth and income in the United States. As you can see here, this is net worth versus financial wealth. And as you can see, the top 1% own the majority, and then the next 4% from that, and then the next five, and then the bottom 80%. They, that's the majority of the people, but they have the least amount of the resources. Um, here's another one on net worth versus age. As you can see, the worth goes up as the age goes up, generally speaking. There's kind of a bell curve um, for the median because it doesn't count equity. Um, this middle part here where it says median net worth, that includes um, home equity and stuff like that, which you only get if you're a homeowner, but that adds wealth. Here's another one um, versus uh, age of the householder of the married couple, and then it has um, what the male and female make. And then there's another one with age, um, median net worth. This is wealth distribution by the type of asset, whether you have business equity, trusts, um, stocks and bonds, um, 
the people, the bottom 90% of people don't have a lot of this stuff, but that's what makes up a lot of the assets and wealth of the, um, top 10%. So the, this shows the actual wealth distribution of the U.S. And then what Americans think the wealth distribution is and then what they would like it to be. As you can see, um, there's a lot of disparity here. Uh, in 2011, a prof couple of professors from Duke asked almost 6,000 people how they thought wealth should be split up. And they asked participants to guess how it actually was and then write up how, you know, what their ideal was. And this is where it came out at. As you can see, there weren't very many, like, the actual is very different than what people think and what they think the ideal is. Um, this big blue bar that's the top 20% of people. The actual wealth that they own is over twice what the ideal would be when you ask normal people. Um, this is income distribution. This is a comparison between 1967 and 2007. As you can see, there's not, um, I mean, there's some change here. The national income going to the top 1% one, 1 has doubled from 10 to 20%. And for the top 0.01%, it is quadrupled. This is the average after-tax income. You can see the... Top 1% is this brown bar at the very top that's kind of going off the chart. Everybody else has kind of stayed where they're at, at down at the bottom. Uh, next is ethnic stratification. Uh, ethnic and racial conflict and hierarchies play an increasingly important role in the distribution of life chances both within and between different societies. The conflict and the competition of scarce resources often fall along racial and ethnic lines because these distinctions are important in defining position in the labor market and world economy as determined in the terms of political and economic positions of different nations. Um, the positioning is result of the heritage of empires, um, the nature of imperialism that dominates the history of relations between peoples and between nations around the globe. Ethnic disadvantage and advantage um, becomes institutionalized by racist and ethnocentric attitudes and institutional practices that justify, maintain, and extend the hierarchical ethnic relations. So this is based on conquest. If your nation or country was conquered by white European settlers, um, they become the dominant ethnic group in that area, such as was the case in the United States, as well as many other places across the world. And everyone else becomes lower on that category dependent on their roles within these different conquests as well. This is a graph of 
median household income by race. So we have Asians, non-Hispanic whites, Hispanics, like any Hispanics, and then blacks. So yes, Asians make more, um, but Asians and non-Hispanic whites make significantly more than Hispanics and blacks. And if you know your history of world conquest, um, whites did not at any point um, conquer um, Asians, um, which is why you see that uh, disparity there. Um, these are wealth ratios. This is black to white and then white to Hispanic. Um, keep in mind these are ratios. So when it gets up to 2009, you're seeing um, 1 to 19 and 1 to 15. Um, child poverty by race. Um, as you can see in this left part, whites are down at uh, roughly 11%. Blacks is 35. Hispanics, 31. And Native Americans, 31. Um, that was 2008. 2016, child poverty declined for most racial and ethnic groups. Um, whites went down. Asians went down. Everybody else stayed pretty close. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, please do so. This is that clip from the homepage. Um, gender stratification, all societies today are patriarchal in nature as it relates to the distribution of power and gender lines. Patriarchal means man over woman, male dominant. Um, with very few exceptions, men rule all of the institutions that make up today's society. In every institutional arena, men systematically have more power than women do. If you don't believe that, look at the makeup of the Senate, look at the makeup of the House, look at the makeup of um, all of your government officials. Even though male to female ratios is about 50-50, um, you're not going to find that in positions of power. It's not going to be a 50-50 split. Um, women are directed and controlled by men in the performance of their roles within those institutions. Um, and that's the case no matter what institution we look at, whether it's family, political, educational, religious, or economy. The ultimate power of men is expressed in their ability to define women as significant, principally in terms of their relationship to men. So what is patriarchy, since we need to know, since this is what this is our reality? It's a form of social organization in which males dominate females. It is the institutionalized domination of women by men in all social institutions. So what is the essence of male power? We have violence. Um, men control women through violence in both public and private spheres. Men control economic resources. Men dominate all positions of state power, as I said with politics. Men dominate all positions of religious organizations, as well as the religion themselves, where often the male is given the divine authority over the female. Gender stratification varies in degree. 
although male dominance is universal. Uh, this next section is economic power. I think this is probably a good place to stop. Um, there will be a part two to this section. So please make sure that you look at that piece as well.